If you're building a web or a mobile application or thinking about doing so, there is a plethora of amazing tools out there for getting the job done. If you clicked on this video, you're probably aware of Firebase, the backend as a service tech from Google. Firebase is awesome, especially for mobile apps. It really simplifies the process of getting things set up initially. And if you combine it with other tools like Flutterflow or WeWeb or even coding frameworks like React or Swift, it can feel like a productivity superpower. But there's a problem that most tutorials ignore. What happens when your app is more complex than some dinky to-do list app? If you're serious about your business or startup, you need a backend that gives you flexibility and stability to let your application grow. And having an API that you control as part of your stack enables you to do that. The list of things that you could do with a custom API is endless, but here are some examples. Let's say you want to schedule a push notification at exactly 8.35 every day, accounting for time zones, except every Sunday, but only if it's not raining, and only to people who like shellfish. But John, Firebase has cloud functions that let you do that. Yeah, sure it does, but let's say that you have 100 combinations of similar tasks, all with their own logic. How do you expect to test them all regularly and be secure in the knowledge that they all still work the way they should every time you make a change? And what if they interact with each other? What if you want to change one parameter that happens to apply to all of them, like rotating an API key? Are you going to make the change a hundred times? How long is that going to take? And what about cost? I mean, you could stitch together a backend with no code tools with say Zapier and make.com and Airtable, but do you really want to be paying monthly for each one? And you have to remember that these tools, they actually make their money from scale. So they vendor lock you first, and then when your app actually succeeds and starts getting a lot of traffic, the cost of the platform now outweighs the time that you saved. Then again, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, so it's important to be diligent and find a balance. And so for me, Firebase, alongside of a custom API, is totally the way to go. Oh, and speaking of cost, if your traffic is low early on, your API can actually live within the Google free tier with the method that I'm going to show you. One more example, let's say you're using Flutterflow or React Native or something like that. And instead of a custom backend, you figure you can write your application logic inside of custom code and just bundle it all with your app. And that's fine until you decide that you want to say a web front end that isn't using Flutterflow. Then you need to rewrite the whole thing again, and you will spend months fixing bugs that you introduce. With a backend API, all of your app logic is safe, well-tested, and it's ready to be hooked up to the new front end. Coding is no longer the daunting task that it once was for non-technical people. Now that we have tools like ChatGTP and Cursor to help us out, we want to be using code because remember the whole point of code is to give a machine very specific instructions. We have a world of flexibility in what we can tell it to do and get a very predictable result from it every time. Firebase is such a useful tool if used correctly. And so in this video, I'm going to show you how to deploy a Python API alongside your Firebase app. And Python is my language of choice because it's so easy to understand, so easy to write. It already has a library for anything that you can think of. It's uber popular with no shortage of community support. And it's the only choice when it comes to AI apps. The Google Cloud Platform service that we're going to be using here is Google Cloud Run. This is really easy to implement because if you've already made a Firebase project, you actually also now have a GCP project and you can just deploy straight to Google Cloud Run with a few commands. So let's dive in and don't worry about the details here because if you want to do all of this yourself, I've also written an article with all of the commands and steps that you need to take. Link is in the description. This is a production grade Python API. This particular API powers an AI enabled houseplant care app that I have in the app stores. I just didn't want the example to be just another dinky toy project far removed from a production code base. But I won't be deep diving into the application code itself since this video is about deployment. But I do want to mention just a few things about this particular API. So it's based on Fast API, which is a really popular and modern Python framework. And what it does is it creates REST API routes. That's HTTP routes like get, post, patch, delete. But that doesn't mean CRUD necessarily, which is create, read, update, delete. You enter these endpoints and you can do literally anything. For example, I have a post endpoint called sync plants. 
What it does is to dive into Airtable, to a database that my co-founder is updating all the time, and it runs some Python logic to parse and commit new plant entries into my Superbase database. And you could have this happen manually from a UI, or as a scheduled task, or anything you want. That's the whole point. FastAPI actually has a built-in UI as well, so you can interact with the API locally and also in production. So now, instead of Firebase Cloud Functions, you create a route for any custom task you want to perform, and you share logic between them. Like, for example, I have this custom function called getCurrentUser. And this verifies my Firebase auth token and returns details about the current user. I wouldn't want to have to copy paste this whole thing a hundred times into all these different cloud functions. It's always the same, but I might want to update it. And in that case, I wouldn't want to have to update it a hundred times in each cloud function. Another huge advantage of having this API is that now I can write automated tests. Let's say I have a HTTP endpoint. It's a get request. So I want to get some information maybe from the database. And it's going to be the index of all of the plants that belong to me as a user. So I can run the tests and I can actually put a breakpoint in this particular IDE VS code and it will stop wherever I want it to stop. I can put these red breakpoints anywhere I want and I can actually inspect the data. So it's just done a get request to my database, which in this case is Superbase. So I can just smash user plants, the variable in here, and it will tell me all about that particular variable. And I can do this for any piece of code. I can do it for any variable. I can do Python code in the debug panel and it will just work. This is really important for testing. And what I do is something called test-driven development, where I actually write the tests and then I build the code around the tests. Then when I go to deploy the API and know that it's always going to work. And every time I deploy it, I run the tests and make sure I haven't broken anything in any of the changes that I've written. Now, just one more quick thing before we deploy this API. This is called a Docker file. And what it does is it tells Google Cloud how I want my application to be built. So in this case, I have certain settings. Like for example, I want to build the application using Poetry, which is going to manage all of my Python libraries. I also have particular kinds of custom code here where I want to attach an admin panel and it has a configuration file. So I want to include that in this bundle. Very often for basic apps, you can just find templates of Docker files online. But the really nice thing is that if it works on your machine, you can feel safe that it's going to work in the cloud as well. Time to deploy the API to the cloud. This is the terminal. It's running a shell called bash on Mac OS. This will be the default when you open the terminal on windows. You can just install something like Git bash to get it going. It's actually easier to do this stuff in a terminal rather than trying to find the right things and clicking right buttons in Google cloud console, but you do need a tool called G cloud. So just follow the install instructions for whatever operating system that you have. So you'll need to be in the project folder of the API code base that I showed you before. So here we are, we're in the Flora API directory. And the first thing I'm going to do is log into Google Cloud. So it's just G Cloud auth login. This opens a browser. It's really easy. You just sign in with your Google account and it will do the right things and then take you back to the terminal. Now that I'm logged in, I just need to set the project ID. And actually I'm going to do this with an environment variable because that way I can use it again later. I also need the region, so I'm going to set a region variable. We'll go for US Central 1. You generally just want to deploy in the Google Cloud data center that's nearest to where your users are probably going to be. After that, I just need to name my service. This can be anything. In this case, I'll just call it Flora API again. And then I need an environment file. And this is actually just a really useful way of giving Google Cloud all of your credentials in a safe way. So actually, inside of my code base, I do have an environment file. And this is a YAML file. It's also very common to just use a .env file, but unfortunately, Google Cloud requires that it be a YAML file. Now, it's important not to check this into version control, which I'll talk about in a minute. You have to make sure that it stays on your local computer. And just in case you're wondering, these values that you see on the screen are not actually real. But in this case, I do have a Superbase project that I'm connecting to. And I also have an Airtable database, like I said before, for syncing these plant entries. And this device key, it's also just part of my API. It's for communicating with an IoT device. Now, what I do is I set this environment file and then I'm ready to go and get things configured. Now, all of these steps are in an accompanying article that I have. So just check the link in the description to get that article and all of the commands that I'm about to use. First of all, I need to set the project, right? I've already set my project ID. So I just use a dollar sign and I can set this to the Flora project. It's also telling me that I need to set the quota project too. So I'll just do that real quick. So now we got this Flora dev project ready to go. 
Now, I also need a project number, and this is just something that's necessary for the commands that I'm going to run. You can just run this command and you can grab your project number in that way. You can also find the project number in your Google Cloud dashboard if you want. And this next one is going to be the magic command. So we've got gcloud, we've got run, that's Google Cloud run. We're gonna do a deploy, we'll give it a name. The source comes from the current directory. So we have that Docker file that I talked about before. It will grab that Docker file and it will compile and create an artifact of this API. Then we have the region and the platform is managed. This is just managed versus uh, Kubernetes, which is also an option, but it's far more advanced. Allow unauthenticated just means that the API is open. It doesn't mean it's not secured. It means that the securing is happening in the application layer. This thing here, project number compute at developer G service account. That's a service account that already exists because you've already set up your Firebase project and it's used as the service account that's going to do the deployments. And finally, you have the envars file, and that's the environment variable file that I showed before. You can actually put these environment variables into the Google Cloud console manually, but this is far easier and far less error prone. And that's it, it's really just one command. I mean, setting up gcloud and setting the project and things, you only really have to do those things once. So that's it, now I just hit enter and it will deploy to Google Cloud Run. Perfect, so with that one command, I've set it up, it's serving 100% of traffic, and we have the URL of the API ready to go. So I can actually just paste this URL into a browser and take a look at it. I don't actually have a home route, I could set one up, but if I go to docs, then I'm able to see all of the endpoints from Fast API, but this time it's on the production application. And that means that my API is ready to go. Now, as easy as it is to run all of this with just one command, we can actually do better. This is Git and it's for version control. For example, I can have a look at my Git branches and I have two at the moment, develop and main. I generally create my features and I merge them into develop so that I can use develop as the development branch. And then I use main for production. But what I actually wanna do is I wanna be able to deploy develop as well as main so that I have two different applications running in Google Cloud Run. And that means I can test my mobile application and I can do all of these things end to end. When it comes to main, I wanna do some versioning. So I wanna create an application that is say version 1.0.1 or something like that. When it comes to develop, I just wanna deploy whatever's in develop at the time because it's only really me and some other testers that will see it. When you're using Git, it's good practice to also use GitHub. GitHub is a place where you can store all of your code on the cloud and keep it safe. What I'm gonna do here is something called CI-CD, which is Continuous Integration, Continuous Deployment. And the way that I do that is just by using one simple file. The file lives in a directory called .github workflows. And I have various different GitHub Actions files in here. This GitHub Action is for deploying to Cloud Run. And what this is doing is whenever I push to GitHub, GitHub is gonna have a look and say, which branches do you want me to do this action on? I want you to do it on develop. And this boilerplate is very easy to find with the AI or with a Google search. So what it does is it checks out my repository from GitHub, which is here. And then in my case, I've set it up so that if it's going to push, then I'm gonna assume that it is on the branch develop as I've set up up here. And I want it to do something. And that something is in a similar way that we did manually to deploy my API to Cloud Run. To do that, I need some environment files, some secrets. For one thing, I need my Google Cloud service key. And this enables the GitHub environment to be able to authenticate on my behalf. To get the service key, we head back to our terminal and we'd have just two commands to run. And again, these commands are in the article. Check out the link in the description to grab them. The first one gets the key file. That's the credentials themselves. Here, we're looking at the I am service, the service accounts, we're getting keys, we're creating a key, we're gonna call it keyfile.json. And since it's not us as the owner of the project, but actually this compute at developer account, this is the one we need to specify when generating the key file. Cool, so now we have this key file in our local directory. Then I'm just gonna base64 encode it. This just makes it a string, so it's much easier to pass around. It's far more portable that way. So I can actually just grab this whole thing by double clicking on it, copy it, and I'm going to paste it into GitHub. Here I need to go to settings, secrets and variables, actions. I'm gonna make a new repository secret, paste in my base64 string, and I'm going to name this secret gcloud service key dev. And I also have this environment variable gcloud project dev. That's just the name of the project. I'm only doing this so that I can have dev and production versions of it running on the same action. And so now that this is set up, all I have to do is push to GitHub. And whenever the develop branch is pushed to GitHub, it will deploy to Google Cloud Run. 
First of all, make sure that your key file is removed. You can put it somewhere else if you want, but it's actually better to just remove it because you can always regenerate another one. The important thing is not to check keyfile JSON into version control. You should never ever put secrets into GitHub. So now I can just do a git add, add all new files and that sort of thing. I can git commit. And then I can push to develop. So what this does is it starts running the action. So you can go to the actions tab and immediately now the action will start to run. Once this is completed, the newer version of your API will be online. Thanks so much for watching to the end of the video. Check out the links in the description. As I said, I have an article that goes through all of the steps again and gives you the commands that you need. Have a happy new year and I'll see you next time.